we offer nonprofits and the work that we do with them. Um, so I'm your host for today or your moderator for today, Gabrielle Burrows. I'm the Senior Corporate Coordination Coordinator um, for the Cable Bahamas Group of Companies. So uh, we'll jump right into it. Our first panelist today is Mr. Elijah Sands from the Bahamas National Trust, and he serves as the Senior Communications Officer. He is a Bahamian naturalist, a photographer, a filmmaker, writer, and advocate for conservation. As a Senior Communications Coordinator at the Bahamas National Trust, he's charged with promoting national parks and Bahamian biodiversity to the world through communication, collaboration, and storytelling. As a certified naturalist, avid birder, and scuba diver, Elijah spends most of his life in the outdoors, seeking the next adventure to fuel his work. Elijah has worked with several international organizations, celebrities, and major influencers to advance conservation initiatives in the Bahamas. His love for his home country is what drives his passion to connect people to the natural world that we depend so heavily on. Elijah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So um, again, to dive right in, tell me a little bit about the National Trust and specifically the work that you do there. Okay. Um, so for those who don't know, so the BNT or the Bahamas National Trust, um, we're the national park managers of the Bahamas. Um, so we manage 32 national parks across the country, um, different types of parks, land and sea parks. We have like four in New Providence. So, you know, if you know there's a park out west, there's Bonefish Park, Cowpen Road. Um, if you've ever been to like Charles Vacation or Wang and Art, you were in a park, which is the retreat ac across from Queens College. Uh, so we manage, you know, 32 parks. Um, we also do a lot of scientific research on Bahamian environments, Bahamian species. Um, we do a lot of, we provide a lot of engaging education to youth through school programs and extracurricular activities. And it also advises to the government. Um, so we advise the government on environmental policies and best practices, et cetera. Um, most people just know the BNT as you know, the, the tree huggers or the people who look <laughs> after the environment of the Bahamas, but we, we definitely do much, much more than that. Awesome. And I can't wait. I already have questions based off of what you shared so far. Um, but I'd like to introduce Sean Gomez. She is the Assistant Director of Public Relations at Access Accelerator, the Small Business Development Center. Sean Gabrielle Gomez is a proud graduate of the University of the Bahamas, where she earned a Bachelor's of Arts in Media Journalism. She has years of experience in many areas of communication, media, and produced three local television shows. She has also had the responsibility of managing public relations, content creation, and email marketing, re-engaging over 1 million contacts and engaging about 50,000 active users weekly. Previously, she held the position of Senior Social Media Account Manager for the Socialite Media, a boutique public relations and digital content firm. Currently, Sean is the Assistant Director of Public Relations at the Access Accelerator Small Business Development Center. Welcome, Sean. Hi, it's nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Yes, it's our pleasure to have you. So tell us a little bit about the Access Accelerator and what you do with the SBDC. So the Access Accelerator Small Business Development Center, which is a mouthful, so I'm going to refer to it as a square quite often. Um, what we do is we support um, and we assist medium, micro, small and medium sized um, enterprises. And what that really means is that, and I like to say we take a, an holistic approach to the way that we support these um, entities. Um, so for us, a lot of people know us because they heard about the funding side, they heard about the grants. Yes, and, and that's all true, that's all good. But for us, what really makes it is that we're able to provide business advisory, training, incubation, and you know mentorship for these businesses. And so it allows us to impact them in a way that it's not just about the funding, it's about really establishing a firm foundation for your business so that you can succeed. And that's our mission right there that, you know, we believe in a Bahamas where small businesses can succeed and we provide those tools and resources for the businesses to do just that. Um, and, and that's what the organization is all about. All right, and last but certainly not least, we have Mr. Delmaro Duncan. He is the head of small and medium accounts sales at Cable Bahamas Business Solutions. Um, Delmaro has attained more than 13 years of experience within the fin financial services industry, as well as a wealth of knowledge in focused areas of strategic sales, relationship management, and customer service. 
He's been recognized and awarded by the commercial banking arena as a top performer and has acquired a diverse number of industry specific certifications in securities, banking, trust, and trust law and administration insurance, where he achieved the prestigious certification of Fellowship Life Management Institute. At Alive, he served in the position of senior Alive partner. He was primarily responsible for conceptualizing, establishing, and building the framework of the Alive Business Solutions Department, where in three years, 40% of market share was attained, with billing revenues exceeding $7 million annually. Um, in his present role with the Cable Bahamas Business Solution Team, Del Mauro has assumed management and oversight responsibility for small and medium business. In this role, Del Mauro has been charged to expand Cable Bahamas Limited's footprint oh, in, the criti- in this critical segment by developing and maintaining mutually beneficial relationships with key stakeholders in the wider market. Sorry. In his leadership role, Del Mauro continues to develop to demonstrate high levels of professionalism and analytical skills and has been recognized by his peers for his ability to provide innovative and comprehensive solutions to problems for prospects and clients alike. In his personal life, he's married to Crystal Duncan Nee Oliver and is member is, is a member of Rotary International Phi Beta Sigma Fraternity Incorporated, Incorporated and is a past president of Toastmasters Club 1600, where he has achieved the highest communication and leadership distinction in the Toastmasters program, Distinguished Toastmaster. That was a mouthful. Welcome. Yes, <laughs> yes it was. I'm just going to say I'm happy to be uh, definitely um, proud to represent the Cuba Bahamas Business Solutions Team. Um, delighted to see our partners, uh, Access Accelerator and uh, the BNT, who we continue to do great things with. So just looking to see how we can better um, serve both these organizations um, to help to help drive the whole idea of, of digitization and, and driving a digital lifestyle um, throughout the length and breadth of the Bahamas. Absolutely. So when people think of nonprofits, of course, we think of the work that you do, what you seek to achieve. Um, like Elijah said, you know, when you think of the National Trust, you don't necessarily think of technology. You think of people who care very much about the environment. You think of, you know, um, I mentioned offline that my cousin works with the National Trust. So you think about someone who judges you every time you use a straw or tells you, you know, all the all the great biodegradable <laughs> toys that you can give your children as opposed to plastic. Those are the things that I think about sometimes when it comes to the National Trust. But, you know, on the other side, there's research that you do. I would have watched, I think, Shark Tank and realized um, just the magnitude of some of the research we do, particularly when it comes to sharks, things like that. So in a nutshell, Elijah, tell me a little bit about how the BNT utilizes technology in the day to day. OK, um, I'll try to make this brief. Um, so like you mentioned, um, and I kind of hinted to earlier, um, we do a lot of different things. Um, we have different pillars of the organization, different elements, different departments, you know, whatever you want to call them. Um, and in each facet of our work, we try to utilize technology as much as we can. Um, we actually make it a priority to use the latest technology, you know, no matter what, you know, form of t- or type of work it is. Uh, so if we go to our primary purpose as an organization, which is national park management, um, a part of national park management is patrols and enforcement in parks like the Exuma Keys Line and Sea Park, where we have um, daily enforcement going on to make, like, make sure no one's poaching or people are adhering to park rules. Um, so we see hundreds of thousands of boaters that come through that park every year. Um, and, you know, that's a lot of people to keep track of. We collect more in fees and user fees for that park. Um, so in the, um, from that perspective, park management, um, we use the latest um, technology, radar and satellite technology to track boats and keep track of, you know, people in the park, making sure that people are in the right places doing the right things. Um, so we use technology for enforcement, smart technology, which is a very popular type of technology, I would call it, but smart, not smart technology. Um, we use that a lot. Um, and- it comes to park management. Um, from our education standpoint, um, we use a lot of um, digitization in our education programs. So we, especially after COVID, um, after you know, physical stuff stopped happening, basically people couldn't gather physically. Uh, we started implementing a lot of ways to still engage with young people and behaviors digitally. And this includes, you know, um, uploading our programs and our projects onto learning management systems. Um, and things that, you know, deliver quality environmental education digitally. Um, so we definitely use um, technology to deliver quality education. And from my perspective, so I'm in the communications and development department, which is essentially fundraising. Um, 
our like our entire fundraising platform program is almost completely based on using the latest technology, using the latest um, information, using the latest data to inform our fundraising strategies. Um, so in terms, of, that's what I focus on because development and communication is what I work in, and we just try to implement. Um, you know, we do a lot of research to figure out what is the industry standard, which is the what is the international standard, and we implement that to improve our fundraising and to manage relationships with our donors and our members, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, Sean, I'll kind of pose you a similar question. In terms of your day to day operations, how critical is the role of technology at the SBDC? Um, it is extremely critical. Um, of course, the pandemic changed a lot of things. But even before then, um, our executive director had a mandate for us to utilize technology. And then the pandemic came and that made that need, <laughs> you know, advance a bit. So we were able to move on to a digital platform called Zulu One. And right now that it's basically all that we operate from. Um, everything for us is now digital. Um, all of our services are now digital. So the business advisory and training that I spoke about earlier, that's now digital. Um, so for us, it's in everything that we do. And so um, we, us having that platform makes it easier for our clients who are on the family islands because this organization is not Nassau centric. Um, we're not focused just on New Providence. So it basically allows us to connect even better to businesses on the family islands because now everyone is basically on the same playing field. Um, the accessibility is the same as long as you have internet and a device. Um, so for us, it's been critical and it's important and it's still the number one factor for us being able to cooperate. Um, as for me and my team, technology is everything on our end as well. Um, social media is a huge platform for us. Um, we have a really good following on that, which I'm happy about. Um, but, you know, that's the way that we push our message and that we're able to basically communicate with the wider Bahamian um, audience and to let them know what we have going on at the organization. And so for us, really, technology is almost basically embedded into the system now because it's the way that we function. Um, tomorrow, from a business perspective, of course, when you think of nonprofits, you don't necessarily think of, I mean, when you think of business solutions, you don't necessarily think of nonprofits. Um, how do we maintain and manage relationships with organize, organizations like these? Uh, and to be honest with you, uh, Davia, that's, that's the key, right? You said it, relationships. It's about um, speaking and meeting uh, with organizations like Access Accelerator and the BNT to understand uh, what, what their goals are and what they are trying to accomplish and how technology can help play a part in that, right? Uh, I mean, it can be as simple as ensuring that we, we get them a, a, a good, robust and consistent um, connection to the internet, whether that's through modem services or fiber services, which is all we always recommend fiber services, particularly if the organization is looking to do a lot more than the average um, internet connection will allow. Uh, but then it even goes a step further, right? Uh, we do a number of bespoke and, and customized solutions uh, for a number of our customers that, that want uh, more than just connectivity, right? Uh, more than just being able to, to, to talk on a phone or being, being able to use your, your office and online um, uh, uh, with your cell phone, so to speak. Um, uh, so we, we have and we continue to look for opportunities to, to offer organizations um, the, that kind of flexibility, efficiency uh, that they need to continue the work that they're doing. Because the last thing an organization wants to do is to worry about if their connection is, is going to work, right? Uh, they, they want to be able to, well, to know. They, they, they want to be able to know that that connection is going to be consistent and, and not, to not even think about it, to be quite frank. Um, they just want to be able to know that they can do what they need to get done uh, to really advance their cause uh, and, and, and achieve the goals that they set out to accomplish. Um, so, again, I guess both to Elijah and Sean, um, these are or the organizations that you run or that you communicate on behalf of are very um, focused on the public very engaged with the public. It seems like communication would be an ongoing thing um, on a day-to-day. -day. What's your primary, like I, you spoke to quite a few of them, but what is your primary way of interacting with the public or the primary stream of communication that you use? I, uh, let's see, um, that's, a, that's a, a good one. So I think, you know, the immediate answer we'd probably say would be social media. Um, just because you reach the most people the quickest way on social media, unless you're using something like SMS. Um, but 
I would say our primary method of communication is actually email. Um, so even though, you know, we do a lot on social media, we may reach more people on social media. Um, I always use impact. Like I always consider impact, right? Impact from communications. And our most impactful communication comes from directly chatting or talking to our constituents, um, but just through email. And most of our social media followers, um, you know, once you have your, your strategy set up right, the content marketing strategy, the idea is to get them from email, I mean, from social media to email, which is where that you can send more refined communication to be more personalized and communicate with them on a, a better basis. So email would be our primary method, method of communication for sure. So it's not something you would see um, from the outside looking in as a general public but um once you get into our um system or into our crm then email is what we preferably use to communicate with our constituents um i definitely have to agree with elijah on that um social media is definitely where we try to get information out fast and announce but for primary i would say that when we're really trying to get uh, serious information out to, especially to our clients who are already on the database, we definitely use email. But our strategy consists of both, really. Um, most times that we send out uh, an announcement on social media um, is usually followed either at the same time or followed by an email that also announces these things to our audience. So we, we work, we use them together in most cases, but if we're looking at the primary, definitely email is the strongest for us right now. Um, but also that just really depends on on the strategy and who we're trying to reach. If it's the real larger public and we need to get something out, then it's definitely social media. But um, for the clients and information wise, email. So we've had an interesting couple of years at this point, to say the least, um, just with the pandemic and all of the implications that that has had. And here you are, nonetheless. Here you have two nonprofit organizations. I guess the SBDC is a little different because I believe that you're subsidized by the government, but still, um, these are you know organizations that really don't, you don't necessarily sell a product. You're not bringing in profits like the average organization and you still have to stay relevant and still have to stay afloat in light of a pandemic. What role did technology play in I guess, keeping things going, keeping you able to do what you do? Um, for the Access Accelerator, it just so happened that this organization actually played a very pivotal role during the pandemic um, because the government has recognized that the small business sector is really the backbone of our economy. And the quicker that we can get the small business sector and that's micro, small and medium sized enterprises who we directly um, affect, the, the quicker that we could get them help and assistance to bounce back and to operate, the better it is for the overall economy. And so for us, it was a need to really get back on the game. Um, and so, like I said, we introduced this digital platform called Zoho One, and it also allowed us to um, have a help center on our website as well. Um, so it's all digital where you, if you needed assistance, you could either send us a ticket um, or email through help center and then um, allow us to respond through an email or digitally um, that way. But the technology honestly was the key for us to be able to connect to all of the businesses because we have impacted about, I think, 15 islands. Um, and so, you know, that's far for us, especially with us being on New Providence. So for us to be able to just even communicate, it was technology based, you know. So for Zoho One, um, basically it allowed us to be in the center of it all and still provide those services that was necessary. Um, and I definitely believe that without us transforming to um, transferring over to the digital system, um, we wouldn't have been able to keep a real tight Pull on the on the businesses to understand what they needed during the pandemic, and let's also not forget, of course, um, we were also still dealing with Grand Bahama and Abaco with the impact of Hurricane Dorian. So the the technology also played a huge role in those areas as well, with um, connecting us to the businesses to make sure that we we're able to you know assist them when necessary. And so the pandemic fostered something called the Business Continuity Loan Program. All of that was done digitally as well. So you know. These, and that was able to impact businesses even outside of those that we considered clients. Um, it basically was open to the wider business community in the Bahamas. And so that, that went from impacting just our immediate clients to the whole world or our country. And so for us, that was extremely important. And so this digital system that we're working with right now is really, really the link that keeps us going. 
Elijah? Well, I wish it was um, easy for us to like take our um, programs and projects digital. It's um, just impossible given the fact that, you know, important part of our work or, uh, you know, one of the biggest things we try to achieve at the BNT is getting people into national parks, um, outdoors and, and outside open spaces, which the pandemic made for the first time in our life, like impossible or we weren't able to get outside and get into national parks. Um, so at the onset of the pandemic, I think we realized a variety of issues, um, serious issues. Um, the main ones being, again, people not being able to travel to the country, people not being able to get into their parks and, you know, visitor fees and um, um, fees from national parks um, help to fund our work and fund our operations. So I think it was one thing people realized a lot um, after a few weeks of, you know, temporary or lockdowns that lasted more than a few days was that people really wanted to be outside. You know, people, we thrive of being outside. Um, we, you know, we foster, like we want a connection with the outdoors. So for us, it was like, okay, how can we still give people some sort of experience, um, an outdoor experience while they're inside of their homes? And, and like everybody was doing something digital, everybody was doing something virtual when, you know, COVID first kicked in. So then we had to, you know, ride that wave as well. And we, you know, started looking at um, what things we could do to still connect people to their parks. And, you know, we were always, at this point, we were very um, comfortable in the the digital world. You know, we weren't, you know, like, we weren't scrambling to say, oh, we know how to use these things. It was just like, okay, now we have to do this seriously to survive. It's it's necessary now. Um, so we started looking at ways we could, you know, provide people with experiences in parks. We started doing virtual park tours and we started um, doing virtual park experiences where we created, I mean, the basis was video, where we created experiences that, you know, were immersive and were able to still show people how their parks were doing and, you know, still show people a side of the bombs they don't really know. At least uh, for a good portion of the pandemic, before things were too serious, we did had um, we did have some form of exemption to be outside because we, again, we have to patrol and monitor national parks. So we were still able to show people live streams and video content from their parks, even though they were indoors. Um, so in that regard, I mean, technology still allowed us to communicate with our constituents. Um, I don't think there was anything um, major that we weren't doing before the pandemic that we started to doing, started having to do afterwards, except I guess have all of our meetings via Zoom. But, you know, I think technology played a pivotal role um, for us during the pandemic. We were still able to communicate um, with our constituents um, and the public. But there wasn't anything really that completely shocked us that, you know, we were like shutting down or going crazy because of technology or the lack thereof. Yeah. Um, Del Maro, of course, you would be managing a lot of the relationships with organizations like the SBDC or um, the BNT as a salesperson or as an account person, somebody who had relationships with these organizations during the pandemic in that transition, did you see a shift in terms of demand or those particular products that those consumers were focused on? Uh, yep, yes, we did. I mean, generally speaking, uh, we saw uh, definitely an increase in demand um, and also a lot of transition uh, from from modem internet services to fiber services and, and for the organization that already had fiber coming into their, into their premise. Um, they increased the bandwidth um, simply because there was a need now um, for uh, the employees and, and, and everyone else who's a part of the organization to do more um, with their internet. So um, whether that means they needed um, extra bandwidth to um, access or in some cases implement um, some sort of a cloud-based solution um, that the team would be able to, to, to work efficiently from, whether that to do uh, with just being able to do more of some of the things like Elijah said, uh, with so many things like doing um, video um, uh, video presentations and and giving access to, to customers and, and and the wider public about the, some of the things that they were doing, or uh, whether it's creating a platform like Sean mentioned um, that would allow um, their um, their people to access the information without necessarily having to come in contact with somebody. So uh, we did see a, a, an exponential increase in in the need for data, uh, particularly, and then we also saw a significant amount of, of customers. Um, converting from a standard, um, what we call a PBX telephone system to more of a, of a hybrid telephone system, uh, which, which leverages the, the fiber network uh, for people to be able to use um, their landline offices um, from wherever they might be, whether it's at home, um, they could be at the beach and, and they can still function as if they were in office. Um, so that technology allowed a lot of organizations to continue to operate as if their doors were open. 
right? And and that and that just allowed business to continue, uh, particularly for many of the organizations where revenue is key, uh, and also keeping in contact with customers is, is key to their success. Um, we were able to uh, assist and facilitate a lot of those challenges and, and troubleshoot a lot of those solutions uh, for businesses so that they can continue. Uh, but the key uh, is always about understanding what it is the organization is trying to accomplish. Uh, there are some general things that we can that we can do that we can implement to help across the board. Uh, but then there are some organizations where we have to get really into the into the details of what it is that they need, uh, and we can customize the solution. So uh, I was not in my head when when Elijah was talking about them having to transition um, to allow um, their constituents to still see their parks, and so um, they they were able to think outside of the box and and no, we can't have people coming to the parks to the state the parks to them, right? So that that involves some some level of, of technology, some some level of innovation, uh, and all. So typically, um, the, the provider would, would have needed to have been able to give them a, a robust connection so that they were able to do exactly what, what they wanted to do. Right? Same thing with access accelerator. Um, we needed to make sure that they had um, the, the, the robust connection and connectivity needed in order to accomplish what they wanted to do with, with the implement, imp, implementation of their new platform. And so it's just, it, it's key about just having a conversation um, with us. So I, I always tell my team to encourage our, our customers to let, let's just talk. Um, help us understand your business. Help us understand the things that that are driving um, the key revenue um, generating activities that you need to focus on. Um, obviously, you want to continue to maintain that connection uh, with your customers in order to keep communication lines open. Uh, help us understand uh, what areas you need um, some assistance with and how technology can help play a part in, 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 in bridging the gap. Um, that that was created as a result of, of the pandemic. And so um, the more we talk to our customers, the more we get to understand the business, the more we get to understand what it is they're trying to accomplish, not only now, but into the future, because people are saying COVID is here forever. Uh, we need to understand how we can help these uh, organizations continue to thrive and succeed in this in this new norm um, that, that we find ourselves in today. All right. Uh, speaking of succeeding in the new norm, that leads me to my next question for Sean. Um, you know, when it comes to the SBDC Access Accelerator, you're dealing with small businesses. And we know that particularly in those initial years of just, I guess, since you begin and, and when you start running, that's usually the fail window for a lot of businesses. But it's also, I guess, a window where you separate, you know, those who are going to be successful from maybe those who are going to have to revisit their ideas. Um, over the last 18 months, what, what kind of businesses that the SBDC would have been throwing financial support behind. Who thrived? Oh, that's a that's a tough question. Um, we actually carry out um, a report or a survey that we allow our clients to fill out at the end of a physical year that actually will be able to give us that better data um, for that. But I think throughout this entire situation, small businesses have been resilient, um, and it's a big kudos to them because it's not easy at all being a business owner, even harder being a small business owner. Um, larger companies have more support, more funding, so they can you know, pivot and do things quite easy. But when you see a small business that is able to see that, okay, this situation is not working, but hey, I was once a storefront and now I could turn this into making it strictly deliverable, um, delivery based, then hey, that's smart. You know, um, For those who um, had other types of stores, um, they went and they changed it over to apps and made it more digital. Um, certain situations like that, we saw a lot of, a lot of pivoting and um, it made us really happy because it really showed that small businesses aren't just in a box anymore. They're really looking out. Um, they're really opening their horizons to seeing what's being done in the United States and with our friends in the region, the Caribbean, and they are utilizing those same type of uh, tools and ideas and making it happen. Um, so I, I would hope to answer your question in more detail at some point in time when we have that data, but we saw a lot of pivoting um, during that time and we were very proud because they were able to keep themselves sustainable um, and survive, even though we were able to offer them um, funding to assist with that. From the get-go, they were able to see where they needed to move to and they did it. Um, so we, we're very happy and proud of the, the businesses that were able to see that need. Um, Elijah, I know you mentioned. Oh, we appreciate it. It was a fun time in Daggy World. Um, 
Um, it's something that maybe we will look at it again, but definitely technology was prime in that way. Um, we usually have a Christmas showcase that allows our clients to come together and um, to bring everyone out to basically see their products. And we were unable to do it that way. And I'm very happy that my executive director was able to see the vision and allow us to use technology to utilize the showcase in that way. So we appreciate that. Uh, so Elijah, when it came to, you were saying that you were doing the virtual tours, of course, while everybody was locked down. After we were all able to go outside again, did you see an uptick in terms of people being present in the parks? Yeah, absolutely, um, would be the, the short answer. Um, I think, um, like I repeated what I said earlier, like once, you know, once people were confined into their homes, I, I'm like, you know, you just started to feel physically, emotionally, mentally drained and stressed. And, you know, there were many things that were causing these, um, these feelings, um, a lot of financial reasons, you know, jobs, all type of different stuff. But I think, you know, at that point, more people recognize that, yeah, I don't want to be inside locked up indoors. I mean, we crave, you know, we, we just crave being outside. Um, Bahamians love going to the beach. Any holiday you go to any beach, we, we'll all be there, right? So, it, you know, people just love being connected to the outdoors. And I think um, once, you know, once we were locked down and we realized, okay, people are, you know, confined, we could pick up on our external communications. We could pick up on the way we promote parks and talk about parks, you know, to kind of build that anticipation for when we are allowed outside again and people can explore these natural spaces. Um, because not only were people locked inside and not, you know, just locked, but confined to their homes and not able to get outside, they were able, they were also on social media more, they were on email more, they were just interacting with, um, through digital communications more. So this was the perfect opportunity to communicate more to the public and to also our constituents. Um, so certainly, um, I think it was July 11th when, um, the majority of our parks opened, um, and we saw like tons of people in parks. Um, and you know, I spoke to many of those people personally, and they were just like, "Yeah, it feels so good to be outside again." I, I didn't even know this place existed, but you know, when I was in my house and I was scrolling on Facebook, or I would just happen to try watching YouTube for six hours a day or something like that, um, I you know scroll upon this place, I scroll upon this video, this photo, this email communication, and I'm I'm so happy I came out. Um, so definitely we saw much more people in parks enjoying national park experiences um, when, you know, lockdowns were lifted um, and people were allowed in public spaces again. Uh, when you mentioned that a lot, just like you said, I was one of those people who didn't know. Of course, you, everybody seemed to know about the Village Road location, and that's pretty much the end of the National Trust in our minds. That's pretty much all that we know. So why are not in Jordan vacation? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> That's, when we think of the National Trust, we think of somebody's wedding, somebody's engagement pictures, or job oh, yeah, <laughs> Unfortunately, you know, and, and I've just come to discover that there is so much more to it. I was in Ibuka uh, about a year or two ago, and I was driving, and I saw the Leon Levy Nature Preserve. And I'm like, oh, what is this? And, you know, I ended up go walking through, and I'm like, this is incredible. This is so amazing. I had no idea that it existed. So that would lead me to ask, what, in what ways are you utilizing technology to get your message more out there? Because there are a lot of Bahamians who I think would really love to take advantage of what the National Trust has to offer, but just really aren't aware um, on a material level. Right. Um, okay, so first thing I would say, um, I hope I encourage everybody listening that if you've been to the draw vacation on Wang and Arts, that is not the end of the BNT. Um, walk out of those gates and go to another national park. Um, but I mean, that's, you know, that's common. Um, we, we get that a lot and we expect it because, you know, draw vacation and Wang and Arts are social events. You get to do fun things. I can't wait until we're able to host another draw vacation in Wang and Art. Um, but like you said, so you visited the Leon Levy Native Plant Preserve, which was is one of the other 32 parks. I mean, incredible natural space, you know, beautiful space, um, celebrating 10 years of that park um, this year. Um, and there are like national parks protect the most beautiful places in the Bahamas, point blank. Um, like parks scattered across the um, Bahamas are just simply incredible. Um, so in terms of how we would use technology to get our message out more, um, I would say that storytelling has been, is the most, is one of the most effective ways to get people to emotionally connect to something. Um, and our cause is conservation. So getting people to experience the environment, getting people to experience nature, to, you know, you know, build that emotional connection so they care to protect it because people only protect 
what they understand, people want to protect what they care about. Um, so it, it starts small. It starts with, it could be something, something as simple as a photo or a video um, posted on social media or sent through email or um, however it gets out, it's that simple. So in 2018, um, the BNT, um, I I would say advocated for us to invest in professional um, video equipment. Um, at the point, it was 4K. So in 2018, 4K was was a big thing. It, 4K yeah. still is a big thing, but um, you have 6, 8, 10K. The good thing is nobody has a 4K phone yet, right? So it's like 4K is still a big deal. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, we invested in 4K video equipment um, that was going to, I know, at least last for a few years, to get us to be able to properly capture and interpret the beauty of Bahamian national parks. Um, and, you know, when we started doing that, it was, I mean, there's a bunch of photos and videos of the Bahamas online just because of our tourism, um, you know, ratings and, you know, how much tourists we get here. But there wasn't really anybody communicating about the environment um, and environmental causes in the Bahamas. Bahamas. Um, so, you know, we invested in professional video equipment that will, you know, go on to become the basis of our um, communication and storytelling around national parks. And, you know, the good thing about communications and technology um, is data, right? Um, data, you, data is accessible. You could easily access the data. Your data should inform anything you do. I don't care if it's fundraising or communication or park management, whatever type of data it is, it should support and inform your strategy. So in 2018 as well, we really started tracking and paying close attention to our data, um, our reach, our engagement on social media. And I keep saying social media, but that's just, you know, one small facet of the real external communications program, um, at least for us. So we started paying attention to our data. And once we started putting out these high quality videos, um, we really started noticing a difference in our digital fundraising, um, aka online fundraising, the way people were communicating with us and also the awareness people had about national parks before they even came to a national park. And, you know, over the years, I've started to meet so much people because I spent a lot of time in national parks. I started to meet people who say, I, you know, visited because I saw this on social media. Oh, and is this the tree that they talked about that was this and that? And, you know, that may seem pretty simple, but then at the end of the day, when that person walks away and you get an email or you get a phone number and then you send a follow-up email or something and then you turn that person into a follower, you turn that person into a supporter. Now you have people supporting your cause. So if you do that about 10,000 times, you have a real good base of supporters that you attracted through simple digital communication, simple visual storytelling. Um, so, you know, that's how me, my team, um, which is the communications team, use technology to support our work in spreading the message of, you know, conservation in national parks. I have, um, we've done trips to Andres um, with our ambassadors just to take some pictures and some pretty videos to post on social media, which seemed pretty simple at the time, you know, and the next year after that, the next full year, um, we were able to not formally or very structured, be able to track how many people started coming to Andres and posting about Andres. Now, Andres is a beautiful place, but nobody really went to Andres to take pictures. Like how they go to Exuma to picture with the swimming pigs and stuff like that. And there were four different influencer groups of people who went to Andres the year after that and did the exact same things we did, visited the exact same places and spent thousands of dollars in the local economy simply from just a few photos we posted on social media. And I always use that example to say, you know, it's awareness, it's, you know, storytelling, it's just, you know, getting the people to know these things exist and get them to care about it, that makes all of the difference. So that's just one way how we use um, digital or visual communication to advance the message and aware, um, raise awareness of national parks in the Bahamas. And um, I guess, Sean, finally, when it comes to the story of Access Accelerator, the story of supporting Bahamian entrepreneurs, what do you wish people understood more about what the SBDC has to offer? Um, I think for a lot of people, they look at it at a very surface level. Um, you know, the organization is supporting businesses and I mean, it's a good thing. But for us, we look at it as we're supporting dreams. Um, we are supporting dreams. We are building legacy. Um, we are basically allowing a foundation for somebody to grow generational wealth. Um, so for us, it's way more than just here's an entity, here's a business owner, here's some funds. For us, it's about really sitting down with that business owner and understanding their passion for it, understanding their love for the business that they are creating, 
Um, in a lot of ways, people are really bringing forth a child. <laughs> you know, they they conceive this idea in their head for so long and they carry it with them for years. And now they finally come to an organization and saying, hey, we actually want to stop and sit down and hear about this dream that you have that you want to actually see in action. And when we do that, we're able to say, okay, I understand you now. I get it. I feel your passion. Here are the ways that we think you can go about doing that. Let me help you. And so we take that from coming in with just this idea to the point where we're actually working on it and it's growing and you get to see it actually form and, and become a structure. And then it moves on to a point where it's like, okay, it's time to give birth. You know, it's time to start. Here's your soft launch, your grand launch, you know, whatever you want to do. And, and for us, that is everything. So for, I think our biggest thing is we don't want people to just see it as we're giving money out to businesses or supporting businesses. We wanted to see it as, we are legitimately helping Bahamians to grow the Bahamas. We are legitimately setting stones and setting, setting a foundation that will allow us to build something that 20 years from now, your child may have it, but they'll still talk about the fact that their father you know, gave birth to this opportunity. So for us, that's what we want to see, um, not just the surface level of it, but the real depth and love that, that is, is, that's there. You know? This is something sacred for a lot of people. Um, they love what they do and they love the ideas that they come with. And so for us, it's just having that understanding um, when you approach the organization. Yeah. Thank you. And Damaro, finally as well, what do you wish nonprofits like these knew about the solutions that Cable Bahamas Business Solutions offers? I'm listening to both of these um, panelists today and I'm, I'm just so excited. All right. I mean, my, my little hamster, if I know who works with my, my <laughs> hamster been running around in my head now for quite some time listening to, to both the speakers talking. And, 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 and I know I've said it a lot today, but I, I want to reiterate it right now. A lot of the things that um, Elijah just spoke of, I, I just started to think of ways that we can help, right? I mean, ways that, that we can really help sort of drive the message based on the question you asked. Um, how do we get um, some more eyes, um, uh, making people more aware of some of the things, some of the great things um, that that the BNT uh, is doing, right? And and I just I, I'm I'm in a different stratosphere right now of of how um, we could help um, to to really push the agenda and, and the messaging behind uh, what what the BNT would need to continue to be successful. And, and uh, if we could take this offline, I, we will, I, I really want to circle back to this because there's a number of ideas that sort of popped into my head um, that, that I would like to have an opportunity to discuss um, both internally uh, with Cable Bahamas team and some of the things we're doing at, at the Cable Chaos Foundation and things of that nature that, that we can use to help uh, the BNT to make some things happen and, and, and that access accelerator. Uh, there's nothing greater than, than watching uh, nurturing and watching an idea come to fruition and, and not being successful. And uh, we understand uh, because uh, working closely with, with a lot of smaller micro businesses, we understand the importance um, communication in general play, plays with the success of an organization. And uh, that communication is very broad based, uh, which includes technology. Uh, and so it, it's just very exciting things for us. Uh, we have a number of exciting things that we are working on internally um, that we are looking to really help uh, many micro and small businesses to continue to be successful uh, in terms of being able to conduct business, um, uh, whether that means uh, processing payments uh, electronically um, without paying too much <laughs> fees to the banks and things of that nature. I'm just trying to leverage um, some of what's already in the um, uh, in in the in the space uh, so they can really help drive um, business and revenue and success for a lot of these small businesses. Um, so there's going to be um, some great announcements coming out. Um, out of the, the Caleb Mahomes Business Solution Camp uh, around some of the things that we that we will help to facilitate uh, for a lot of small businesses. Um, uh, the team is working very hard to make it happen because we know it's going to be a game changer, uh, particularly for a lot of small businesses. And so um, definitely um, want to speak more with the team from Access Accelerator um, so they can understand and get to learn about some of these things that, that, we, that we are looking to roll out. Um, they may be working on them themselves, so it, it might be a great idea for us to get together and talk about these things that, that, that we've been working on, very exciting things, particularly uh, focusing on small business, because as Sean said, it is the backbone of our economy. And um, and that small business, uh, they're, they're the greatest innovators, right? Uh, they're the greatest innovators because in most states, they're forced to innovate. Uh, yeah. and, and that's the kind of innovation that, that we want to embrace uh, and to really 
to really drive and push that message um, throughout the length and breadth of this country. Because uh, once people know it can be done, and once they see it happening, people tend to get more excited and more people tend to jump on the bandwagon. So I'm uh, just very excited about everything I, I, I've heard. Uh, and and I, my little hamster uh, <laughs> probably needs some water because he's really been running. But we will definitely look to see how we can further um, deepen and strengthen our relationships with both the BNT and Access Accelerator with some of the creative and innovative things um, that, that that's coming out of the space um, with, with um, our charitable organizations and, and civic organizations and, and, and the work that the Access Accelerator team is doing as well. Awesome. Thank you so much. So before I let everybody jump off, uh, I want to see if anyone else's hamster wheel was going. I just want to open up the floor for any questions. So if anyone who's tuned in, if you do have a question for any of our panelists, you can actually type it into the chat uh, so that they can answer it for you. I see, I see a comment from Camilla just speaking about the Leon Levy Preserve. Um, and I have a list. I do have a list of Bahamas National Bahamas National Trust National Parks that I plan to visit. I think next up is Bonefish Pond, um, which is so sad because it's probably about 15 minutes from my house and I have never been there, but that's next Bonefish, up on my list. Bonefish Pond is the one that's on that far, Trail Road, right? Uh, that's Harlan Wilson's pond. So that one is closed. Bonefish Pond is off Cowpen Road. Um, you you nah, do have to turn yeah. off Cowpen Road to get to it. And you should visit. Yeah, it is. Pretty, it is Harlan Wilson because when I was... Um, Really, really active with Rotary. Did we did a cleanup that we were pulling out the the corn dog looking bush? What, what do you call that? The cattail. Yeah. <laughs> right. We, we were pulling out the cocktails um, on yeah. Harlan Wilson Bond. Oh, that was a day. <laughs> that was a, that was a day. Well, um, you should but, see it now. The cocktails are like a different story, different level right now. <laughs> yeah, for real. Uh, yeah, but that was fun, and, and it was the first time I ever visited um, uh, the the Harlan Wilson um, uh, site. And it was, it, it was, I was like, we have this stuff here. Like, this is really exists in this country. And so it was, it was very amazing uh, to see. And it was, it was a really enjoyable experience. Um, just doing our part to help, help the BNT. Listening to both of you talk, I, I literally sat here and I, and I started following both, both organizations on Instagram, right? And I just, I'm like, you know what, Mario, you need to, you need to be in tune with this stuff. So I, I literally just, just followed both of your organizations on Instagram. And, and I'd encourage anyone who was, who was watching. Um, to also do the same so we can continue to learn more about some of the great work that you guys are doing. Absolutely. So I don't see any questions. So I just want to say thank you to both Elijah and Sean and of course Del Maro. Um, and as we close, I'd like you to give an opportunity. Obviously, both of uh, your organizations are nonprofits and you're focused on helping Bahamians in one way or another. So I'd like you to just let the public know how they can support what you do in a practical way, how they can follow you, where they can find you, and if they want to donate or just get access to some of the resources, what they can do. Um, I am going to put my name and uh, email contact in the chat for anyone who might want to have uh, any questions or any um, need some guidance or anything to do with technology, um, then you can reach out to me. Um, and for the BNT, um, you can certainly visit our website, um, www.bnt.bs. Um, you can learn all about the BNT there. You can see all of our programs and projects. Um, that's one thing I didn't mention. We do a lot on our website as well. It's an information hub um, for national parks in the Bahamas. So you can definitely visit our website to get involved. Um, you can become a member of the BNT. It's like $30 a year. You get free admission to national parks and a bunch of different benefits. So um, just you know, head over to our website and you'll see all of the information and you'll learn more about the stuff we um, partially discuss on this call. Let's talk about a membership thing, Elijah, because you know you only pay every job vacation. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, yeah, you know, you should have got a call from us about a week and a half ago. We had a phone a thon for people who only renew our job vacation. Um, but no, BNT membership is more than just discounted admission um, to our events every year. You got to think of it as an investment into like the natural capital of the Bahamas. I mean, it's $30. You probably spend more money on that on coffee in two weeks, you know, two fifty. We ain't going. I have I have some expensive habits. We yeah, I mean, and we have a very like we have a great rewards program as well. So we have local businesses who offer discounts to BNT members for supporting the environment, and then also we have international partners um, in the UK, in Switzerland, in Jamaica, um, in the Caymans, I think too, that offer discounts or free admission to their properties if you are a BNT member. 
So just head over to our website and our membership page, and you'll see all about the perks of BNT membership, apart from literally supporting the environment that keeps us alive. Are you guys able to, to facilitate like payments online and things of that nature as well, or we have to, yeah, yeah, we, we're definitely um, we yeah, I, I only I really only touch like this much of how we really use technology, but we could take any sort of payment online. You know, just we're ready to receive your money. We make it very easy for people to give money to us. Yeah, and something like the church. The parks. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> That's good, though. That's good. Um, to learn more about the Access Accelerator, you can visit us um, www.accessaccelerator.org. You can find us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, if you Google us, our Google My Business will pop up and give you more information on us. Um, and to support us, really, to support us is by supporting small businesses in the Bahamas. Um, that's our mandate. That's our, our drive every day to get more Bahamians to shop local, to shop at home. Um, so if you want to support the Access Accelerator, uh, visit one of our clients. We have, we're very transparent. We have a full list of all of our clients who've ever received funding from any program initiative that we've ran um, listed. So you can look at those businesses and just support a small business. Uh, take a friend out to lunch to a small restaurant or buy a nice trinket from a local vendor. Um, so that's the best way to support us right now. All right, and we did actually get a question. Um, this one is for Elijah. Is there a cost for the virtual tours on the BNT website? No, there is no cost um, for the virtual tours. Um, we have two types of virtual tours. You can sign up for a guided tour where someone from our outreach team will give you a tour of the park, or you can just go and visit our virtual tour center where we just have um, like videos set up as virtual tours. And one thing, just one more thing we're working on actually, when it comes to technology, you think of technology giants, you think of someone like Google, right? And we're working on something with Google Arts and Culture where we're going to be bringing um, 3D and immersive tours of Bahamian National Parks awesome. to the public. So um, just keep, stay tuned for that. It's pretty exciting. I'm actually going to the preserve this week um, to pilot that project and hopefully create a, a new immersive experience on Google Arts and Culture's platform um, to allow people to visit their national parks. Wow, wow. Well, I want to say just one more time, thank you um, to each of you for sharing. This was so informative on a personal level. I'm sure our panelists enjoyed. I'm seeing some positive comments or I'm sure our attendees enjoy it. I'm seeing some positive comments from them coming through. Um, in the event that you do want to share this with anyone, we did stream live on Facebook, so you will be able to share. Um, but thank you and just wishing you all the best with the very important initiatives that you're working through. We definitely will, will seek to have you again on Think Beyond and to everybody who tuned in today. Thank you for watching. Um, wishing you a wonderful afternoon. Thanks a lot. Have a good one. Have a good Thank day. you. All right.